Welcome to the webinar on creating a more productive and innovative organization. I'm Dr. Charles Chapin. This is the release of a resource document for organizations of all kinds to help their employees be more productive and innovative. And we spent a lot of time thinking about ways that documentation or text could go into an employee handbook or as a, as a separate communication tool with employees, whether they're working from home or in open office environment or whatever it might be to do better. And organizations are really thinking about this and hoping that they could get some help here. So here's the help. So what is this document and why? Well, we know that distraction and inattention and wasted emails and meetings, they limit productivity and innovation. In fact, distraction costs 15 times as much to organizations as the out-of-pocket costs associated with sick leave. And research suggests that employees are focused only about 60% of their work time. So you're losing like two days out of five of productivity. And that could be everything from smartphones, to emails, to background noise, whether it's working from home or in a closed or open office space or whatever it might be, all of those things can have a great impact on an individual being product, uh, productive and innovative. So, and we know that employees are challenged to create and innovate given more modern technology. We constantly have screens in front of us and having that deep thought to really innovate, look at problems from multiple perspectives and think about solutions really requires attention. And we know that our attention is fixed. We only have so much of it. So if we're devoting our full attention to our smartphone or even part of our attention or resources on our smartphone, that limits the amount of time that we're gonna be able to focus our attention on the work that we need to do. So this really is guidance regarding all the things that I've already talked about, meetings, emails, video conferences, working from home, making decisions on how to manage those things without them managing us. So the purpose here is there is a resource for organizations and we're giving it away. We're just gonna to copy and paste it into an HR document or whatever it might be, knowing that there are certain things that you would see as applicable to your organization and things that you might not see applicable, you just take them out, right? Um, and then we are obviously able to help you in terms of implementation, because some of the things that are part of this are really part of a larger cultural change that are required. And we'll dive into that. So I'm gonna walk through the document today. And then I'm also gonna kind of outline some things that, okay, here's what's not in the document, but this is kind of what you can do. So let's get started. Well, the physical work environment, this is probably, there's nothing here that's really gonna surprise you. So we know that even low levels of that background noise can cause distraction. Again, our attention's a fixed quantity. And if we start devoting our attention towards another conversation, that's gonna impact our work. So not a surprise here. So to, to minimize distraction, we really need to think about uh, maintaining a quiet workspace as much as possible, right? So you know, noise makes them disrupt, makes open office uh, particularly disruptive. And if you're having a conversation or you need to have a phone call, find it in an alternate space. Now, for some organizations, it very likely could be, well, we have a couple of closed offices that you can book, and we see that a lot. So that may be something that you would add to this document. We did not put that in here uh, because maybe you don't have that, but that's an, that's an ideal scenario, certainly. We know that workers tend to feel uncomfortable holding discussions in front of others. This obviously causes issues of low productivity, and whatnot. So again, this is really not that surprising. Employees are encouraged to explore alternate spaces to have discussions with coworkers. And then the third piece of this, which is a little bit different, and that is that if you're if you're in an open office space for an organization, develop a desk sign or some sort of signal that the employee can use when they're in focus time. So I like the idea of it being standardized because if it's not standardized, then it's one individual kind of saying, look, I'm really trying to focus and they make their own sign. They may come across as, as being perceived as uncollaborative or whatnot. So having the organization develop something that can be a signal can be really, really effective. Now, I hear from managers who say, 
their first response to that is, well, what if everybody has their signs up all the time? Well, yeah, you don't want that because that's not necessarily going to be collaborative. And in some cases gets in the way of a, an open office space or the purpose of an open office space. But I say, you know, have the signs, have a standardized sign and then have conversations with employees about it. When you, when you initiate it, and when we do consulting and come in and work with an organization, it's a great conversation to have with the mid-level folks and say, well, how much time do you really need to have focused? And, and a lot of times folks are really honest. They'll say, well, you know, just a couple of hours a day will be great. They're rarely going to say that it needs to be seven and a half or eight hours. So, but having that standardized really can help because we also know too, that if I'm in an open office space and I'm working hard to try to signal that I don't want to be distracted, that's actually taking more of my attention, my cognitive resources, signaling that I'm distracted, that, that I don't want to be bothered. And again, taking away from my work. So probably the most obvious elements of that is the physical work environment. And that kind of continues on from working from home. So we know noise is distracting and is stressful in the home offices and this is on site. So find a quiet, dedicated space, not a surprise. The, the things I would add to that, and there's things organizations want to add when it comes to working from home, I would say predominantly the organizations that are really challenged in this work from home environment, I mean, we're three years out from COVID right now, is because they're not providing that resource, right? And managers aren't having conversations with employees about best ways to work from home. Concentrated time is important, right? So for an organ for an individual, plan your day around where you're going to be as far as your location, your meetings, and your tasks. So give yourself structure. What we see, and probably what all of you see if you're working in HR or in training, is individuals working from home really are susceptible to a lack of structure in their days. So encourage employees to develop that structure around, okay, this is going to be my email hour in the morning, and maybe my email. Uh, half an hour in the afternoon or whatever it might be. And this is, here's going to be the time where I really need to work on writing, or this is where I need to have conference calls or whatnot, but have that structure and, you know, do your best to be kind of systematic with that, which could be, which, which could be really, really helpful in saying everybody knows, okay, this is the time that this individual tends to be in emails and whatnot. Now, if you're working with external clients, that's a challenge. Obviously you're not going to have the same time every day, available, but trying to be consistent and having structure can be really, really helpful. Managers just need to have the conversation. More often than not, just starting that dialogue can be helpful. And when I say, you know, providing structure, I don't mean in the sense that, that managers need to micromanage employees working from home. Having objectives is really, really important. What is it that we need to get done within a given quarter, within a given week, within a given day, whatever it might be, is obviously going to be helpful. But then the other part about that is just help having structure to the individual, especially when you're you know, thinking about it from a psychological perspective. Working from home, your home tends to be a place where you don't necessarily have a lot of structure. So when you're working there, you could kind of fall into this trap where you're, you're not giving getting enough structure to get your work done. So structure is really, really important, both from the manager perspective, but also thinking about it relative to the employee. And then the other piece about this, including in the in the in this resource document, is encouraging employees to find ways to have boundaries when it comes between their work and personal environment. Now that's really really tough for some people. I live in New York City, and that's challenging in a place like this because people don't have necessarily a dedicated office. So you can do certain things, like I tell people, cover your workspace when you're not working. Have that boundary, which is really really important there. But some element of a boundary is absolutely critical to get yourself out of that workspace when you're not working. And at the same time, get yourself a little bit more structure when you are working. So I don't, I didn't include in this, you know, covering your workspace that would go into a resource document. And that's something an organization may not want to go to that level. So I didn't include it. But when we do workshops and whatnot, we talk about kind of taking that approach. Okay. Getting into things that are, I think, probably less obvious. I don't think I shared anything so far that's like incredibly surprising to you. Um, if it is, though, that's great. Uh, so let's talk about email. So we know with internal emails, we have lots of data that suggests that employees spend an enormous amount of time on sending emails, even internally. 
And then of course, reading the email, managing the email. So we, so we, we tend to, in a lot of cases, we'll get an email, we'll decide, okay, we, we, we spend time reading it, right? We may have a reaction to it that could be emotional. We could be thinking about a response and then we don't respond. We move on to something else. Now we have to respond to that email at some point. So when we do, what do we do? Now we got to go back. We got to reread the email. We got to go through another thought process and then we got to respond. That's an enormous amount of time. So what I say first and foremost, which kind of goes back to a little bit of what we were talking about in, in when it comes to working from home is managers need to have a conversation with employees, with their, with their direct reports about email communication. And what I mean is thinking about things like, okay, how formal does it need to be? And we talk to organizations all the time that have say, well, you know, I just thought because I was sending it to my boss that I really needed to spend time on it being really, really formal and really worried about, you know, providing all this context and whatnot. And then we would talk to the manager and the manager's like, I didn't need all that. Well, you got to have that conversation. So what are the expectations around email relative to formality? frequency, how often does that need to happen? And we see it even in working from home that there are employees that feel like they have to email often. Does this kind of like check in? It's almost like a time clock for some employees. I'm working, I'm working. That's why I'm sending this email. So they kind of over email, which causes a whole different problem. And then expectations regarding response time, right? So how often do you need to respond? And are there signals that you can use in emails to say, okay, I need a response to this soon. You can put it in the subject line and whatnot. Those are really, really basic things that managers aren't talking to their employees about, and they're wasting enormous amounts of time when it comes to just internal emails. So talking about that best approach is absolutely critical. So checking emails kind of similar to that. So employees need to monitor their email inboxes, and ensure that they're responsive to colleagues and clients. And again, too much time is an issue. And in some cases, we see data that suggests some, some employees are, are looking at their email inboxes up like 30% of their workday, which is way too high. You know, my joke is always, it's a terrible joke, but my joke is nobody has a title director of email, right? You have other things you need to do. So you need to manage this inbox, right? So supervisors are really encouraged to offer employees guidance on ideal frequency of checking their email. For supervisors, there's lots of really interesting data on that. So supervisors tend to like most people tend to be on their phones a lot looking at looking at email and what we find is that people that are in executive positions when they start checking emails and they kind of are responding to emails that time after they do it they tend to be far more in the weeds they're not as strategic of thinkers because they're really into the weeds because of where the emails has kind of sent them so for executives it's just as important for you to be okay Here's going to be my email time. This is when I'm going to when I'm going to go through a review and then I'm going to respond to it. And having that regularity can be helpful. Now, off hours are a critical element. We all know that. And there's times where we have to send emails off hours. But as managers, you know that that causes a ripple effect with your direct reports, because if you're sending emails on off hours, you're in some cases, unless you're having that conversation, you're sending a signal that there's some element of an expectation or it's a good idea for an employee to be responsive to that during those off hours. So <clears throat> you just have to be mindful. And it's not that there's anything wrong with it's, you know, it's a rainy Saturday. I'm going to get caught up on my emails, but have that conversation with the employee. I don't expect a response this time. I'm just clearing out my inbox or again, having the conversation up front, schedule time to commit the email, email, email expectations for a response. So when it comes to external communication, I think it's really important, particularly when it comes to clients. Okay, here's kind of what I'm thinking regarding uh, res reasonable response time to emails and deadlines and whatnot. And that can help manage expectations. In a lot of cases, not having that conversation forces the, forces the employee to say, well, this is a client, I wanna get back to them as fast as possible. And in some cases, it's too fast, right? There's not enough thought put into the response. And we all know that that happens. Or there's more information needed. So a second email needs to happen. But we just need to say, you know what? I will get back to you in to a client. My process is I'd like to get back to clients within 24 hours or within 
three business days or whatever it might be, but have that conversation again up front. You're noticing a thread here with, with the client, with the prospective client to say, here's what, here's, here's kind of how I handle emails. Is that going to work for you? So let's talk about meetings for a second. So meetings are always fun to talk about and always fun to complain about. So one of the things that always comes up, which is the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to consulting with organizations is that meetings are expensive and people forget that, right? If you, if you have 20 people in a room for an hour, you're paying those people, that's their salary for one hour, 20 people. And is it worth that? And in addition to that is, Everybody going to have an opportunity to really weigh in if there's that many people for an hour long meeting. So we need to be thoughtful about that. So they're expensive and everyone's time is valuable. Otherwise they wouldn't be there, right? So if we have too many people around the room or too many people on the Zoom call, people feel like they're being left out. This is the biggest one. So Meeting organization, obviously you need to share an agenda ahead of time. And sharing the agenda ahead of time doesn't mean five minutes before or even an hour before, right? So again, we'll go back to if, we get, if we're sharing it via email, all right, if we're, if we're an organization that's trying to manage email, we see that we're losing productivity based upon it and we develop a new email policy. When we get to meetings, we got to make sure that we're not sharing meeting agendas an hour ahead of time as well. We need to think about it in the longer term. We need to think about maybe we need to send it out three days or a week ahead of time. And more importantly, it's not like a program at a concert. Meeting agenda should not be just a checklist of what you're gonna talk about. What's the point of that? How is that gonna help? Instead, outline your discussion topics and put in there a couple of important things. What are the questions that you want the group to answer ahead of time? So if I know that we're going to make a decision on a specific thing, so I use in prolific, I use the example of uh, speakers for the upcoming conference. We're going to talk about the upcoming conference. So instead of on the agenda saying, you know, 2023 conference saying, who are we going to invite to speak at the 2023 conference? We need names. We need to make a decision at that point of what it's going to be. So people are thinking about it. Otherwise, if it just says, you know, in this example, the conference, I don't know what in the world we're going to talk about, and I haven't really prepared, right? So having specific questions are really important. That helps people be better prepared. And also it helps with the flow of your meeting, because if the question gets answered, you move on, right? Which is really, really, as we know, is really, really important. And obviously it keeps the group focused on what the meeting's purpose is. So I think a lot about this idea of, um, and I didn't include this in here, but I included in prolific and I included in a lot of the consulting is, you know, for a meeting agenda, one of the best things to do is what are your, what are your quarterly goals? What are your annual goals? And how is this meeting impacting those meeting those goals? And, and, uh, and it happens all the time. And it, I find it kind of funny. The organization's somewhat funny, but sometimes they don't, but they'll say, well, those meetings that they don't, they're, they're not connected to the goals. Well, then why are you having it? What are you doing? And if it's really important initiative, the meeting is, then maybe we need to be thinking about including it in the upcoming goals. So although it seems like a lot, if you're trying to keep a group focused and you are at, leading an organization that, you know, your job is to align the resources to meet goals, having an agenda that has the has the relevant relevant goals for the organization at the top that impact that meeting is really, really helpful. Even if you don't talk about it, it's a reminder of what the goals are, which is really, really critical. Um, I didn't spend time talking about goals much, by the way, in this document. We talk about goals in prolific and we talk about goals a lot when it comes to consulting. Um, what I would say about that though is, you know, the, the connection between goals and motivation and focus is really, really tight. So, you know, we talk about like smart goals and things like that. And it's really, really important because if I'm motivated, if I've got a goal that's say intrinsic, meaning I'm, you know, I'm doing it for the sake of doing it, I really want to accomplish this goal, I'm more likely to be motivated to deal with my environment, to focus my attention time on what it is I need to do, and I'm gonna accomplish it. So 
what I would say is we don't include language in here on uh, on goal development, but it's part of prolific and it tends to be part of our conversations with organizations. And a lot of you, especially if you're, you know, well, really, if you're anybody at middle management or higher, you know, when you go into, you know, whether if you're a CEO, you're going to the board, or if you're, you know, reporting to the C-suite, you all know that if you can get individuals above you to think that something's their idea, it's a great thing, right? They're they're more likely to espouse that idea and take it on. And you've got, you've got them now part of what you think is a great idea. The same though holds true with people that are reporting to you. So when we get this idea of goals, and it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's important is if we could get the people that are reporting to us, developing goals that they think are theirs, and they are theirs, but they're their idea, the likelihood of them achieving those goals goes way up. And we have lots of data on that. So yes, we are paid and promoted based upon our performance. And that's critical. We call that extrinsic motivation. But the intrinsic is important too. And if we can get our direct reports, our department, our organization doing their daily work and meeting goals that align with the organization's goals, but they feel like this is their way of doing it, their way of helping meeting that, your likelihood of having a more productive and innovative organization goes way up. So you have a top-down approach for you have, you know, your, your executives and your senior senior leadership has their goals that cascade down through the organization. But if you can facilitate those folks reporting to you, seeing what your goals are, and then figuring out their way of helping meeting those, now you're in a really, really uh, sweet spot. So that's my goals tangent. We'll get off on that. So uh, closing up on meetings. So, so to maximize engagement and effectiveness, organizers should encourage to hold meetings in comfortable distraction-free environment. Not a surprise, right? Start your meetings and end them um, on time. You, you got to do that. Don't wait on people because then it just snowballs. People say, well, the meeting never starts on time. So why should I report on time? Next thing you know, now all the meetings are starting at 10 past, right? If you're organizing the meeting, one of your responsibilities is not, is not only the things we talked about in terms of setting up that meeting for success when it comes to the agenda and the goals and the questions you're going to ask, but it's also that facilitator. You're making sure that everyone is talking. And I, I do some facilitating with like with boards and that's the role of a facilitator is making sure everybody's heard and everybody's weighing in. And again, if you feel like everybody wasn't able to weigh in, then either your meeting's too short or more than likely you got too many people around the table or in the meeting. Um, and I already talked about this idea of identifying goals. So social work environment, this is touchy, but it's important. Um, so the way we structured this is this idea of, well, basically this idea of incivility. Now, I think it's important from a distraction perspective because what's commonly known by organizations is that, well, if people are the target of incivility, their performance is gonna suffer. From our perspective, their productivity and innovation is going to suffer. We know that. However, what is not as well known is that if you witness it, you are not the perpetrator and you're not the target of it, but you witness it, you are also going to be distracted. So having a good work environment is important for all the reasons that we all want to have a good work environment. But it's also important to note that incivility if there's incivility, say in a meeting, you've got your, let's go back to our example of 20 people in a meeting, and there was one person to target and one person to the perpetrator, 18 other people are more likely to be distracted because they saw that, which is really, really critical. So the language in here, I expect that there are some HR departments are going to adopt what we're doing and they're not going to, they're going to delete out this piece, <clears throat> pardon me, and that's perfectly fine. I wanted to include it just as a reminder that Incivility has, multi, has a ripple effect across the organization when it comes to distraction. Okay, video conferencing. We're getting close to the end here. So video conferencing, we know that there's this element of Zoom fatigue. Um, it is, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And you all know, you've all experienced it. I mean, you may be experiencing it right now, listening to me. Everything from the size of faces being larger on a screen than what we're accustomed to. If you've got a big screen and you're looking at a face big, 
in real life, that that's that's a threat. You see somebody that close to you, it's it seems as if it's a threat to everything from that to seeing yourself on a screen, which can be very, very challenging for a lot of people. Lots of different reasons for it, as we know. So employers are encouraged to use video meetings sparingly in the way they would use face-to-face meetings. I would say, too, that there's opportunities to do it actually better. So meeting leads are encouraged of being aware of video conference fatigue. And you know, one way around that, by the way, and one of the best things I think about video conferencing is you don't need to schedule it for 60 minutes or 30 minutes. You can do 10 minutes. You can do 20 minutes. You know, it's it's because it's so easy to jump on and jump off. You don't have to you don't have to take an hour just for the sake of taking an hour. It can be a check in. Um, a sense of belongingness is really really important. It's a challenge. You know, the 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 epidemic of loneliness was serious before COVID, and now it's even worse. And you know, when it comes to working from home, I understand all the reasons why people want to do it. It's important to note though, we had a lonely population before COVID and it's kind of, and for some people, I think it's a be careful what you wish for because those folks felt isolated when they were going into the office and now they're not even going into the office. It's a, it's a bigger challenge. So how you can, a sense of group belongingness is really, really important. And a lot of people do a lot of great things with this when it comes to having team spirit and, and doing things, you know, on the front end where, it's just you know some some element of sharing something positive, sharing something personal. That's really really important, right? And there's a time when when you can do video conferencing, particularly internally, that it basically is okay. We need to get this done in 15 minutes, and we can do it. And you're very very focused and sharp. And there's other times as a leader where you have to think ahead of time. You know what? We need we need to take some time here and doing some things that are going to foster team spirit or this feeling of belongingness is really, really important. And so as a, as a, as a CEO or as a leader of an organization, you got to know when the time is to be really, really focused, not keeping people on and having zoom fatigue and getting things done. And then there's time where, okay, I don't get to engage with these folks. I need to engage. And by the way, let them engage with each other and finding ways to do that, you know, and, and, and things that, and whether it's consulting or executive ed that I lead, you know, you've got the capability to do breakouts and doing breakouts about things that are relative to work and things that aren't can be really, really helpful in, in, in team spirit and belongingness and whatnot. Organizations have policies on, on cameras. I wanted to include it here. Um, in a lot of cases, I think making people feel comfortable uh, is really, really important. Yes, we like to see people and there's real value in that, but there's also a lot of anxiety that people feel when it comes to having their camera on. And so I what the language that I put in here, uh, and by the way, the bold that's in this is, is just bold for the purpose of this particular um, uh, recording and webinar. It's not, it's not in the document, but I just basically wanted to outline that and identify that. And some organizations really want to see everybody and others others have a little bit more of an easier policy on that. My, my point would be just address it. Just say what it is that you're, you're planning to do. Um, micro breaks are really, really important. Encouraging folks to, you know, we all have meetings where, you know, we hear from other people or we may ourselves going back to back to back to back on video conferencing. That's not effective because you know, how are you getting your mind in that space for the next meeting? And how are you having that break for yourself to just get up and stretch and get ready to be mindful heading into the, your, your next meeting? We also know the data on multitasking and Zoom meetings is incredibly high. So people are doing multiple things during the meetings. That's not only more stressful, but there's higher, there, there's, it, it's, it's obviously, obviously tiring but it's also just higher levels of errors that come from that work. And you're not thinking through things really, really well. So, you know, if you're the person leading these meetings and you have to meet with direct reports, you know, back to back to back meetings on Mondays or something like that, and you're multitasking through half of each of those meetings, then maybe you need to spend, you know, commit to, okay, I'm going to do 30 minutes with my team. And then I got to do 30 or 20 minutes or whatever it is on my own to do all those things that I otherwise was doing during the video conferencing. Because basically what happens when you, you know, as we all know, when you're multitasking, 
you're, you're not anywhere, right? You're not, if you're texting on your phone to a colleague during a video conference, you're, you're not focused on the video conference and you're not fully engaged in what you're texting. You're actually doing neither of those things really, really well. So that's the guide. And so basically we're giving this away. We'll be, we're sharing this via, via email later today. Um, we basically do a lot of different things when it comes to implementation of this. So we do surveys on the front end and you know, always recommend that. Just talk to people. What are the obstacles in individuals doing their best work? And in some cases, it's interviews with senior staff. Sometimes it's just a straight survey. Lots of different ways to do that are focus groups with larger organizations. Executive workshops are helpful because you're setting the tone as executives. What's the email policy going to be? What are the policies regarding you know, video conferences or working from home? How much of a resource do you think the organization should be giving um, when it comes to employees working from home? And talking to senior leaders and CEOs, it's interesting to me how many have such a strong opinion about working from home and say things that aren't, that aren't working. And my next question is, well, what kind of resources are you providing? And they say none. And so they basically come and say, well, I can't lose my workforce in, in bringing everybody back to the office. So let's do that resource. Let's try that next step. Um, and then we do online and in-person programs on, on how to help with the goals. And then Prolific is our on-demand program when it comes to, when it comes to we, we also do it live too, uh, whether it's in-person or video, that's really focused on, okay, what's the individual's hurdles that they have as an employee when it comes to distraction? What do they think about relative to, to goals, to emails, to video conferencing, and then how they can develop a solution for going forward. So you feel free to, uh, you can email me uh, at, uh, it was my website, charleschafin.com or email me uh, and how we can implement this guide. But we're so thrilled to be presenting this uh, to any organization that wants to use it. And we hope that it's useful to you.